My name is Matt. I'm an attorney at Start Art Legal. This is Jake. He's the founder. You want to tell a little bit about what we do? Yeah. So I started Start Art Legal about three years ago, coming up in three years, I guess, with an eye towards trying to help art students who weren't getting any sort of a uh, legal or business education in art school. That kind of led to the idea of, of starting a law firm that focuses mainly on people in the early stages of their legal career, which has ended up being a lot of educational, as it has ended up having a large educational component. So through that, Matt and I get to do fun workshops and lectures like this, CLA, other Bay Area organizations. We work with visual artists, performing artists, nonprofit corporations, and we help with all sorts of you know legal and business needs. And we're excited, Matt, Matt's joined recently, yeah. and I'll let him take it away. All right, yeah, so I worked at CLA, this, this nonprofit, for uh, quite a while before I joined Jake. I started off uh, doing, working as a law fellow, and then I was a program coordinator, and then I was their staff attorney for a little while. And then after I uh, finished up the stuff that I wanted to get done here, Jake reached out to me and I thought, great, this is fantastic. Could kind of continue what I wanted to do over at Start Art Legal. So that brought me over here. And tonight, we are gonna be talking about Mickey Mouse and the public domain. So first off, just a general disclaimer. This is just general advice. Nothing here creates that lawyer-client relationship. And it's Mickey, information, not advice. It's, yeah, yeah, it's information. Strictly information. And Mickey <laughs> is not yet in the public domain. Okay, now we've covered ourselves, let's, <laughs> let's talk about it. Okay, so this is Mickey Mouse. We can all agree on that, right? Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So let's talk a little bit about the background. So for those who don't know, Mickey Mouse was not created by Disney. This guy, this is Disney. He was created by this guy. His name is Ub Iwerks, great name. So back in the 1920s, the Walt Disney Company was originally known for producing a series of short films about Alice in Wonderland. And so it was this real live action with cell shading on top of it. Disney liked the new cell shading stuff. But in 1927, Disney was growing tired of that and so was the public. And so their distributor, Winkler Pictures, had asked him to come up with a new character. So Disney and Ub created the character, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. So Oswald uh, had a poor first showing, but then in his second outing, it was the cartoon Trolley Troubles, and that was a hit. That was a huge success, and Disney thought, all right, we've got, a, we've got something good here that we can use. And then Disney lost most of his staff when Winkler hired them away from him. And then he found out that he did not, in fact, own the rights to Oswald. That was owned by Universal. So Disney had been cut out of the loop. So what do you do in that case? You make a new character. So when I was doing my research uh, for this project, uh, one of the videos that I watched, some guy phrased it that Disney was a startup guy. You know, he'd, he'd try something out, he'd get as far as he could, but if that didn't work, he'd move on to the next thing and he'd keep doing that until he found something that worked. So while they were looking for something, they came up with a number of characters. Clarabelle Cow, Horace Horsecollar, and this is Flip the Frog. So all these characters were developed by Disney and Ub during this time. Now, they would all go on to have, to appear again in later incarnations. Clarabelle is, and Horace, both in Disney stuff. Flip would appear in his own series, not in Disney for a while, and then kind of develop his own following. None of them really took off, although they were all created. And then, Ub Iwerks created the character Mortimer Mouse in 1928. He was based off a sketch that was made by the artist Hugh Harmon. So Hugh had created a, he took a picture, a photograph of Disney, and he sketched about four or five rats surrounding Disney. Make of that what you will. But this <laughs> gave Ub an idea, and then he came up with the character Mortimer Mouse. And the public was saved from this name by Disney's wife who felt that the name was a little too arrogant. So she thought the more friendly name work would work, and that would be Mickey. So this guy over here, that's Mortimer, as he appears in 1936, because he was reintroduced into Disney. And I think that that one was uh, Mickey's rival, I think was the name of that cartoon. So he's a rival with Mickey for Minnie's affections. But he's, he's, he's his own Disney character now. He came back. So Mickey originally showed up in two cartoon shorts that were only shown to test audiences. And these were Plain Crazy and Gallop and Gaucho. One of the reasons these were only shown to test audiences was that Disney could not, for the life of him, find a distributor. Which is good because neither actually tested well with the audience. I'd like to point out that in Plain Crazy, he wasn't yet Mickey. He was still Mortimer. 
Mickey would come later. So what was the key to this? So the jazz singer had recently come out. This is not a movie that holds up well these days, but it was the first, one of the first to use synchronized sound. And he, Disney correctly predicted that synchronized sound was the future of the movie industry. So he wanted to incorporate it. So Disney and UB and a few people who technically worked for Winkler Pictures at that time, but Disney had convinced them to come back to help him on this one project, they came and they produced the cartoon Steamboat Willie on a skeleton crew. And then they tested the sound. Now, they didn't put the sound in first. They wanted to know what an audience reaction was. So they had everyone bring their families to a theater, and then all the animators stood off stage on instruments and planks and everything, and they did all the sounds themselves synced up to what was happening. They rehearsed a few times before they did it to make sure they could get it down. And the audience loved it. Now, this is kind of like your parents coming to your play when you're 13 years old, so I don't know how authentic it was, but it was enough for them to push through. And they found a distributor, Celebrity Pictures. And Celebrity was run by a guy named Pat Powers. They also used Pat Powers to produce the sound. So they used Pat Powers' Cinephone system. Pat Powers did not create the system. He stole it from a guy named Lee DeForest. Lee DeForest had the phonofilm system, and at that time, Lee was drowning in lawsuits and could not afford to sue Pat Powers. So this kind of skated through. This was a hit. It was the sound that did it. So everything was going well. Ub and Disney eventually did have a bit of a falling out, and he left in 1930. This gave Disney top billing and it resulted in a slight redesign of the character. And at this time, Mickey would go through several kind of revisions over the next few years. And then Mickey got his Academy Award nomination in 1932. This helped make Mickey a bit more of a household name. He was already growing at that point. And Disney had received an honorary Academy Award for the creation of Mickey. So things were starting to work out for Disney. The first official color film was the band concert in 1935, which greatly increased his popularity. If you have not seen the band concert, you should go try, try to look it up on YouTube. You'll probably find it. It is a great cartoon. It's not very long, but it's extremely well done. And then Ub Iwerks came back in 1936. His little endeavor that he did didn't work out, and so he came back and was welcomed back in Disney, and they continued iterating the character. Mickey eventually developed into what you see over here in the pointer, and that was in 1939. At this time, Mickey was very, very popular because he was a bit of a scamp. He went on all sorts of misadventures. He'd get himself into trouble, and he'd have to get himself out of it, and kids loved that. However, after that Academy Award, and then slowly and increasingly over the years, he became a role model. And Disney didn't want him doing those sorts of adventures. So that was phased out, and instead Donald Duck got to do that instead. And so during the 1940s, Donald Duck was for a time more popular than Mickey because he got to do all the fun stuff. And then came the Mickey Mouse Club. And once again, Mickey's a household name. But then copyright happened. Yeah, so I'll give you the groundwork for copyright here. When we're talking about copyright, let's just remember you know, what we're talking about. And that's just that it's basically legal protection for authors of creative works. Copyright actually comes from the Constitution. It can be found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the U.S. Constitution. And that gives Congress the power to, quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. That then is codified into U.S. law, and you find it in Title 17 of the U.S. Code. And the current law that we're working with today is the Copyright Act of 1976. You'll see as we present this that there's a number of different um, copyright laws, but currently we're dealing with 76. So. I said limited time, so how long does copyright actually last? Copyright grants the author of a creative work a number of exclusive rights for a limited time. Currently, that limited time is the life of the author plus 70 years, and that's for works created after January 1, 1978. So this is, again, the 76th law. For anonymous works or pseudonymous works or works made for hire, copyright will last for a term of 95 years from the year of its first publication or 120 years from the year of its creation, whichever one of those uh, comes up first. And then what happens? After the copyright term ends, the work automatically goes into the public domain. Unlike trademark, where you can you know, keep, keep, keep reapplying and keep, keep, keep it current, copyright expires. So it's a, it's a 
a big part of why we're here tonight talking yeah. about Mickey. So what does copyright protect? Well, copyright gives authors a, uh, a number of exclusive rights. So the author of a work has the exclusive right to reproduce the work in copies of phono records. They have the right to prepare derivative works. So, you know, works based off of it. When you see those, when you see your Warhols, you know, and it's 17 different Maos, like he's the only one who gets to do those. Uh, nobody else gets to make their, you know, blue Mao or their pink Mao. And copyright gives you the right to distribute copies of phono records of the work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership. So if we're talking about licensing, renting, lease, lending, basically. And it gives you the right to perform the work publicly and display the work publicly. What does it not protect? Okay, so copyright doesn't protect ideas. So when I say it doesn't protect ideas, if I paint a picture of a lamp, I don't own the idea of a lamp. I can't stop everybody else from painting a lamp. I have the right, I have the copyright to protect my per particular image of a lamp, but you know, I don't own that idea. It doesn't protect procedures, methods, systems, processes, concepts, principles, or discoveries. These are all things that typically patent would, would cover. It doesn't, cop it doesn't cover works that are not fixed in a tangible form. In the modern age, when everybody has a recording device in their pocket, it's harder and harder to find things that are not fixed in some sort of a tangible form. But the example, I'm assuming this is from the copyright.gov yeah. website, um, they give you know, a choreographic work that's not been notated or recorded, or an improvisational speech that's not been written down. Good luck finding you know, something that's not recorded in some way. So if it's not fixed in tangible form, if the paint's not dry, not yet copyrightable. It doesn't cover titles, names, short phrases, or slogans. That's what we're talking about when we talk about trademark, usually. So our Coca-Colas, our Nikes, things like that. It doesn't cover familiar symbols or designs. Again, probably trademark. Mere variations of typographic ornamentation, lettering or coloring, mere listings of ingredients or contents. These are things that are just so basic that they lack any sort of creative element that would, that would lend them to, to being copyright protected. So by all means, you can create a very creative and beautiful artistic calendar. But if you're just making a grid with numbers on it, it's probably not going to get you copyright protection. So how the heck do you use copyright to protect, protect your work? Well, according to the 76 law, you don't actually have to do anything. Once the work's fixed in tangible medium, it's protected. There's no registration necessary. You don't have to actually take any, any action. You, if you're the author, you own the copyright. Except that if you want to actually enforce your rights in that copyright, it's very, very beneficial to have it registered with the US Copyright Office. Registering the work gets you into federal court, and registering the work gets you access to statutory damages. And that's huge because proving actual damages in a copyright infringement case is really hard, especially if you can't compel somebody to turn over um, documents or information. So if you haven't registered your work and somebody's infringing your work and you want to prove actual damages, you say to them, hey, turn over all your documents and show me how much money you made. And they say, no. And then that's the end of that conversation. But if you have it registered, A, you can get into federal court, B, you can say, this is how much money the law allows me to sue you for. And actually, C, which isn't on here, is you can say, and you're going to pay my attorney for me. So it's really, there's a lot of benefits wrapped up in, in registering. And then we talk about the public domain. So when we talk about, you know, when copyright expires in the public domain, it's just, it's, it's just public domain is made of all the works to which copyright law does not or does no, no longer applies. And that can either be because its term expired or because the author forfeited it or the author expressly said, like, I don't want the rights to this. Like, By all means, like, put it in the public domain, use it. So, it, you know, it can, either, it can either expire on its own or, can, or the author can basically deem it in the public domain. So there's been three major revisions of copyright law by the United States. There's been a bunch of little ones, but there's been three big ones. That's the acts of 1790, 1909, and 1976. Right now, we're in the 1976. But the very first one that was created, at least under the US law, was the Copyright Act of 1790. So th the reason for that was the encouragement of learning by securing the copies of maps, charts, and books to the authors and proprietors of such copies. So you can kind of see what they had in mind when they enacted this. Now the statute itself was based on the British Statute of Anne, which was enacted back in 1710, long time ago. Now at that time, they thought that the British Act itself didn't apply to the colonies. They didn't think they needed it. They said it's an agrarian society. What are they going to need copyright protection for? Your farmers. This was maybe another sore point in you know, the whole revolution thing. So an author was granted the right of printing, reprinting, publishing, and vending. And then to gain protection, there were a lot more formalities back in the day. First, you had to deposit that copy with your local district court. 
then within two months of depositing, you must publish that work in a U.S. newspaper. You remember those? A U.S. newspaper for four weeks. And then within six months of publishing, you have to send a copy of the work to the Secretary of State. And if you screw up any of these, then you forfeit. And once again, Act only protected U.S. citizens. This is the Act. This is the entirety of the Act, these two pages. And so that Act had a bunch of little revisions until finally, and coming up on 1909, and I'm going to do my best Teddy Roosevelt oh, impression. Yeah. Our copyright laws urgently need revision. They are imperfect in definition, confused and inconsistent in expression. They omit provision for many articles which, under modern reproductive processes, are entitled to protection. They impose hardships upon the copyright proprietor, which are not essential to the fair protection of the public. They are difficult for the courts to interpret and impossible for the Copyright Office to administer with satisfaction to the public. Bully. So the modern reproductive processes is what's going to, which was the kicker. There were so many new ways to evoke copyright, and it was becoming so difficult to administer that a big change was needed. So it added a number of rights. You now have the rights to print, reprint, publish, copy, and vend the copyrighted work. You can now translate the copyrighted work into other languages or dialects or make any version thereof. You could deliver or authorize the delivery of the copyrighted work in public for profit if it be a lecture, a sermon, address, or similar production. And you could perform or represent the copyrighted work publicly if it be a drama. So what's one thing that is not included in this so movies don't appear on this list. It's books, it's periodicals, lectures, dramatic musical compositions, maps, works of art, models, reproductions of those works, drawings, photographs, prints, but no movies, no audio or visual. That was added in 1912. There's some key provisions that I want to point out. So section three provides that the component parts, and that's the important part, the component parts of a work shall have their own protection. Section 9 requires that in order to be provided protection, a work must be published with notice. Section 13 requires two copies of the work to be deposited with a register of copyrights. And Section 15 extended copyright protections to foreign works. And Section 18 specifies the notice requirements that the notice of copyright required by Section 9 of this Act shall consist either of the word copyright, or the abbreviation COPR, accompanied by the name of the copyright proprietor, and if the work be a printed literary, musical, or dramatic work, the notice shall include also the year in which the copyright was secured by publication. Now, a big reason that this act came around was foreign works. So those could not be protected, but there was starting to be a burgeoning market for U.S. works going out, and the other countries were not too happy that their own works were not protected. So several authors were proponents of this. Mark Twain was a big proponent of the 1909 Act and getting that foreign works section added in there. And so it was added, but with the caveat that any foreign works that wanted U.S. protection first had to be printed on American typesetting <laughs> in America so they could get their profit first. So the term. The copyright term for 1790 was a, only a 14-year term. It could be extended for an additional 14 years. You had to renew, and that's for an overall 28-year period. The Copyright Act of 1909 provided a 28-year term, which could be reviewed for another 28 years for a total of 56 years. So you can see it's doubling. And in 1976, that originally provided that the work would be protected for the life of the author plus 50 years or a total of 75 years if the author was a corporation. So it also affected works created prior to 1978 by extending the renewed terms protection for another 28 years to 47. If a work was created before 1978 and properly renewed after 28 years, it would enjoy a total period of 75 years of protection. I just threw a whole lot of numbers <laughs> at you. So what does this mean for Mickey? First off, there's that copyright component. The Mickey Mouse that appeared in Steamboat Willie was a component of that work, and therefore it has its own protection. That character that appears has its own protection independent of that movie. However, that protection is tied to the original work. That means when the copyright term for Steamboat Willie expires, it will also expire for that character. 
Steamboat Willie was released in 1928. Disney properly renewed the copyright in 1956. The second term would have ended in 1984, but thanks to that 1976 act that we just went over, the protection was extended to 2003. Pretty much forever, right? Nothing to worry about. But not if you're Disney. One thing I want to add is that the requirements for the 1909 Act, all that was necessary for federal protection. If you were unpublished, well, then you were protected under state law. This created a common law copyright. You don't really see that these days, thanks to the 1976 Act, but we'll get more, maybe get a little bit more into that. But yeah, for a time there was state law copyright. So Disney plays a long game. Disney looks ahead because they want to keep control of their characters and they want to plan accordingly. So they saw that it was going to be up in 2003. So in 1990, a number of companies, including Disney, Time Warner, Universal, Viacom, a whole bunch of sports companies and other entities, many other entities and performers began lobbying for copyright extension. Disney was not the only one, but they were perhaps the most visible. So in 1998, Congress passed the Copyright Term Extension Act, CTEA. The CTEA was known by a number of names. It was known as the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, the Sonny Bono Act, or by its detractors as the Mickey Mouse Act, because a lot of people were claiming that Disney was pushing this through just so they could get extended protection. So under the CTEA, any works that were made after 1923 but were still protected by copyright at the time the act passed in 1998 would not lose their protection until January 1st, 2019 at the earliest. In the case of Mickey, this added another 20 years onto his existing protection. Mickey would now not enter the public domain until January 1st, 2024. So what were the arguments that were made to push this act through, or at least the ones that they officially made? So the supporters of the act were arguing that a person's life expectancy had risen dramatically <laughs> since the first copyright laws were made and that it would be unfair to an artist if they lost control of their work during their lifetime. And also, they mentioned that there was now a huge export of entertainment and other IP materials to the wider world and it would be very beneficial and profitable for the United States if they continued this trend. That might have had something to do with it, too. But people did not go quietly. So there was a case filed, Eldred v. Ashcroft. So Eric Eldred was a programmer and an internet publisher, and he argued that the law was unconstitutional and sued. So he had three arguments. The first one was the biggest. He said that by retroactively extending copyrights terms, Congress had violated the requirements of the Constitution's Copyright Clause, which gives Congress the following power. To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited, I added that emphasis, limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. He was saying that it's no longer limited if you can keep extending it. He also claimed that any copyright law must be subject to scrutiny under the First Amendment, thereby ensuring a balance between freedom of speech and the interests of copyright. And number three, that the doctrine of public trust requires the government to show a public benefit to any transfer of public property into private hands and that the CTEA violates this doctrine by withdrawing the material from the public domain. So on the other side, the government argued that Congress can retroactively extend terms as long as the extensions are for limited times. This argument prevailed. They stated that, well, they've already done it. We've had the 1909 Copyright Act, and that extended the term of copyright. And then you had the 1976 Act, and that extended the term of copyrights. So, of course, we can do it. In the Court of Appeals, the plaintiffs added an argument stating that the Copyright Clause requires Congress to promote the progress of science and useful arts, and that retroactive extensions do not directly serve this purpose. Ultimately, the Supreme Court found the law constitutional in a 7-2 decision. They found that the Acts 1790, 1909, and 1976 were precedent, and they also said that under for limited times, any time was acceptable as long as it was not forever. You could extend it 200 <laughs> years, but hey, there's an end. That's a limit. So Eldred, well, he just wasn't happy. That bit him, didn't it? <laughs> I do want to point out, Eldred wasn't the only one in this suit. He was joined by other publishers, but he was the one that brought it forward. The Ashcroft was the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, was ge Attorney General at the time <laughs> that this case reached the Supreme Court. While it was going through the courts, Janet Reno was still in office. So here's the one small mistake, and this could have been a doozy for Disney. 
So in the 1990s, a researcher discovered a problem with the original Steamboat Willie copyright notice. The notice read, Disney cartoons present a Mickey Mouse sound cartoon, Steamboat Willie, a Walt Disney comic by Ub Iwerks, recorded by Cinephone Power System copyright. Roman numerals, Roman numerals. <laughs> Others saw this too, and what's the problem with that, Matt? So they mentioned that there does have to be a name after copyright. Here, there are three names. So, three names before the word copyright. So you have Walt Disney, Ub Iwerks, and Cinephone. So therefore, all three of the people or companies listed could lay claim to the copyright of the work. And under those very strict laws of the 1909 Act, this could not be considered an effective copyright notice. And if it's not effective notice, then it should fall immediately into the public domain. Uh -oh. So he brought this forth, and then other people cottoned onto this. The first was a law professor, and he raised this in his class as kind of a hypothetical question. Hey, does anybody want to research this for extra credit? And one of his law students did, and she wrote a very thorough paper on all of this. And she found that, you know what, he might have a point. And so then other students and other people just started jumping on this bandwagon and saying, hey, it looks like Mickey should be in the public domain. Disney was not having that. Mm -hmm. So what happened was Disney threatened a lawsuit for slander of title. They said that you are intentionally clouding title to Mickey, and we're going to sue the next person who does that. It stopped. All mention of this stopped. Nobody wanted to take on Disney and its lawyers. Mickey was safe in Disney's hands until January 1st, 2024. And up until that point, Disney had earned a reputation for being rather harsh when it came to suing for this. And we're going to talk a little bit more <laughs> about that when we come to our trademark section. So at this point, with Disney firmly in control, it's only a matter of time until Disney began lobbying to extend the copyright term again. And then the internet happened. So. In October 2011, Bill 3261 was introduced in the House of Representatives. So this was called the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA. So this bill would allow copyright holders and the U.S. Department of Justice to seek court orders against websites that were accused of facilitating copyright infringement. This bill was supported on both sides of the House. Interestingly enough, this bill also gave Congress and the Department of Justice power to reach outside of the U.S. to find people who were violating these rules. Around this time, the popular site Mega Upload, which it was based in Hong Kong at that time and was shut down right around the time that this went through. Some people online were a little upset because it, it was really easy to steal stuff using Mega Upload. For those of you <laughs> at home who don't know what Mega Upload is, if you, knew, if you know what Napster is or something along those lines, it's a site where somebody could upload something that was just a file that was on their computer, other people could look for it and then download it. It was like a database to find it. It was really easy to steal stuff. Share stuff. <laughs> Share stuff. Thank you. <laughs> and so a small war happened on the floor of the house. On the side promoting the bill, you had Disney, the MPAA, Microsoft, Time Warner, L'Oreal, Capitol Records Nashville, ESPN, Warner Music Group, and over 400 other organizations. These were big organizations, and they were all very much in favor of this bill passing. On the other side, you had all the search engines. You've got Google, you've got Yahoo, you've got, well, whatever else is, was still there. <laughs> you had the Wikimedia Foundation. They, they run the Wikipedia that everybody uses these days. You had Facebook, you had Twitter, you had Indeed, you had the EFF, you had the ACLU, and then you had thousands of other little websites, and they were all pushing against it. And then this happened. On January 18th, Google the English Wikipedia webpage, the EFF Foundation, and over 7,000 other websites participated in a media blackout. So they blacked out their pages. And then if you clicked on it, it would have an explanation of this is what will happen should the SOPA pass. When the dust settled, following this protest, many companies pulled their support. Microsoft pulled out real fast. And once they left, a whole bunch of others started. The exodus began. So the main complaints around that bill centered around overreach and a lack of transparency. Ultimately, that bill died due to lack of support. It was a good idea, but it just didn't go through. So why, why didn't it work? Why did the CTEA work, and why did SOPA fail? So it was the Internet that allowed opponents of the bill to quickly organize and educate a large amount of people about the bill in a very visible way and very quickly as well. That one day that they were able to get that information out with all those sites blacked out, all of a sudden people started contacting Microsoft, Apple, everybody else who might p 
potentially have supported the bill. Following that SOPA defeat, there have been no further attempts to extend copyright protections. I talked to a number of other uh, copyright lawyers who, or nonprofits that had worked in this area to get their opinion on this matter and looked at a bunch of articles to say, why do you think this won't happen? And it all comes back to SOPA. They say that because SOPA failed, that sends a message out to every, anybody else who might try it that it's just not going to work. And a lot of money was spent on getting SOPA through lobbying that it was wasted. And so nobody wants to try that again. They just don't think it's going to work. At least that's the theory. So because of that, the public domain opened again on January 1st, 2019. At the beginning of this year, all the works that were made in 1923 fell into the public domain. It was magnificent. <laughs> The Internet Archive had a, had, a good, had a fun little celebration around that time. Also, I want to point out, Internet Archive, great resource. I think they have a data, somebody has a database of all the stuff that has now fallen into the public domain. So what does this mean for Mickey? It is likely, very lawyerly term there, it is <laughs> likely that Steamboat Willie will fall into the public domain on January 1st, 2024. But... It's not going to go quietly. So the first case that I want to bring to your attention is Klinger v. Conan Doyle Estate Limited. And so this was filed, I think, in the Seventh Circuit in 2014. So what happened was the estate of Arthur Conan Doyle threatened to sue and blacklist a publisher of a book that used the Sherlock Holmes and Watson characters. The estate argued that Sherlock was a complex character, and the complexity did not appear until those later books which are still protected, because Sherlock Holmes was published for a while. They argued that if the complex characteristics are protected, then the entire character is protected by copyright, almost as if every character that appeared later on renewed the copyright at the time. So the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals rejected this argument. They found that new Sherlock Holmes books could be created by anyone as long as they didn't use any of the complexity that appeared in the later original books. I don't know if you guys have seen that Holmes and Watson movie that recently came out starring Will Ferrell and Jonathan C. Riley, but if you put com <laughs> complex character in that movie in the same sentence, it doesn't work. So, so now let's turn this back to Mickey. So I'd like everybody to take a look at this guy on the left and this guy on the right. So this guy on the right, this is the Mickey that we know and love today. This is the Mickey that appeared in Steamboat Willie. So if Mickey falls into the public domain, this is the one that will fall in, not this one. Because this has those complex characteristics that won't appear until later. But Disney's not out of the fight yet. so. The name Mickey Mouse and many images were registered as trademarked by Disney in 1933. As Jake's going to tell you in a, just a minute, trademarks don't expire. They can keep being renewed. Disney has historically been very aggressive when defending their trademarks. So the, the, the big case that everybody loves to cite is that back in 1989, they sued three daycare centers in Florida <laughs> for painting Disney characters on their walls. What happened was Disney World had just opened in Florida. And so Disney was, of course, a bit more vigilant when it came to that area. So word got out that, hey, so these Florida daycare centers, they paint them on the walls. Disney swooped in and said, no, you can't do that. It's not fair to the other places that have properly licensed the characters from us. Take them down, please. And so no daycare center will stand up to Disney, so they took them down. Meanwhile, Universal Studios was upset that Disney had beat them <clears throat> to the punch of opening their amusement park, because Universal Studios Florida was also starting to come up around that time, but Disney beat them. So they wanted to get back at Disney, so they swooped in along with Hanna-Barbera, and they said, it's okay, you can use our cartoon characters. <laughs> we'll support it, and we're gonna have this big opening day where we're gonna, we're gonna paint the characters, we're gonna have people in costume there, and we're gonna make it a whole big thing. So it was mainly two rival companies kind of going at it and using these poor daycare centers <laughs> as their battleground. All right, Jake. Yeah, I'll just talk very briefly about just sort of a reminder of what we're talking about when we talk about trademark. We mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it's worth uh, repeating now. 
So remember, a trademark is a device, commonly a word, phrase, or logo that becomes associated by the public with a good or service. The point of trademark is basically consumer protection. We want people to know that when they open a can of Coca-Cola that there's going to be that Coca-Cola recipe inside and not something that somebody whipped up in their bathtub. We want to we want to make sure that we're, we're buying what we think we're buying and we don't want to be confused about that. So as long as your mark's used in commerce, as long as you pay your fees, and as long as you prosecute potential infringers and defend that mark, it can it will never expire. You can you can keep renewing it into perpetuity, unlike copyright. So here, both the name Mickey Mouse and the many different images of Mickey have been registered, trademarked. And the big question is, so is that then, if copyright's going to expire, is that enough to protect Mickey? And Matt's going to let us know. The answer is maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Okay, so this brings us to our next case. This is Daystar versus 20th Century Fox. So in 1948, Dwight Eisenhower published the book Crusade in Europe through the publisher Doubleday. That same year, Fox acquired the rights and produced a documentary. It happened very quickly. In 1975, Doubleday renewed the copyright to the book, but Fox did not renew the copyright to the TV series. In 1988, Fox reacquired the rights to the TV series and began licensing. They went back to Doubleday, Doubleday said sure, so they began licensing. A few years later, this company called Daystar purchased videotapes of the original <laughs> documentary that was shown back in 1975. They edited them to remove out all mention of Fox. This, I believe, is called a reverse passing off. And then they sold them under a new title, World War II Campaigns in Europe. Not shady. Not at all shady. <laughs> So, of course, Fox sued uh, in 1998, and they claimed that Daystar had infringed the copyright to the TV series and had infringed Fox's trademarks by removing all mention of Fox and passing it off on their own, that reverse passing off. So the U.S. Supreme Court ruled only on the trademark claim. The court held that once a work passes into the public domain, anyone may do what they want with the work and need not credit the original author. Justice Scalia wrote that if Fox had prevailed on the trademark claim, it would have created a species of perpetual patent and copyright, which Congress may not do. Basically, you can't backdoor into a new copyright by using trademark. On remand, the district court dismissed Fox's trademark claims. However, they found that Daystar had infringed the copyright to Eisenhower's original book, as the series used <laughs> passages from that work in the film version and the copyright to the book had not yet expired. Daystar appealed, but the Ninth Circuit affirmed. So in the end, they were not liable to Fox. They were liable to the estate of Dwight Eisenhower, who still owned the book. So either way, they, they were being sued by somebody. And so interestingly enough, there was another pop fiction character in the public domain who ran into this trademark issue. So that was Tarzan. So Tarzan was created back in the day. But then the heirs of, well, Edgar Rice Burroughs created his company, ERB Inc., in I think 1923. His heirs trademarked the name Tarzan in the 50s, I think it was 1956, and they also trademarked a number of his other characters, such as John Carter, from the A Princess of Mars a series of books. Have you, did you guys see that Disney movie that came out a few years ago, John Carter of Mars? Nobody did, did. that was one of the problems. Um, it's not a bad movie, <laughs> but that's John Carter. Okay, so in 2000, 2012, a case came through. So there was a comic book publisher called Dynamite Entertainment. Dynamite is still around. That they published two series called Warlord of Mars and Lord of the Jungle. And they thought that, okay, if we don't use the name John Carter and Tarzan in the title, then they can't get us for trademark. And so, of course, ERB sued. And... They said that these things are they're still protected by trademark. And they said, well, we didn't use the name, so you can't get us on trademark. And they said, well, you know, still copyright. And so ultimately what happened was they settled. And now Dynamite has the rights to use those names, and they have two new series going. So they, they tried to argue that we have the name trademark, and they said, well, the copyright's up. We can use these characters however we want. And it looks like they can. But one thing they changed was the covers to the comics. One of the things that really made ERB Inc. mad was that they said the covers are very risque. So I looked into it purely for research purposes, and they are. So new covers, two new series, and with Tarzan and John Carter with new covers on them. So this way everyone's happy. So what does this all mean when it all comes down to it? This means that on January 1st, 2024, Mickey will pass into the public domain unless something crazy happens between now and then. It's the law, anything could. 
you will only be able to use that black and white version, remember Klinger, you might be able to get away with the name Mickey. You won't be able to use the name Mickey Mouse. You definitely won't be able to use the word Disney. And there will be some lawsuits <laughs> of people trying to use Mickey Mouse and, and Disney saying no. That will probably get settled fairly quickly afterwards. And that's the end until 2024 when this finally <laughs> gets settled. There's us. Thank you very much for watching. If you would like to see more videos by California Lawyers for the Arts, Please like and subscribe to CLA's YouTube channel so we can provide full service live streaming programs soon. Our channel will be producing videos that cover all kinds of artistic, entertainment, and intellectual property legal issues. You can also find our videos on Facebook and livestream.com.